are those are the things that we've learned and at the same time I'll also share some other variations and techniques especially if there are things that may fit our use case and other techniques that I think is important in order to make sure that we have a stable application after five or six years or more. All right, so to quickly introduce myself, I am Joshua Arvin Lett. I am the Chief Technology Officer of Complete Business Online, Insight, and Jepto. So they are Australian-owned companies, and we're building a lot of things. We have a lot of projects. So from the name itself, Complete Business Online, we have a lot of projects. And we have Insights, we're building technical products, and then with Jepto, it's a machine learning powered startup where we're doing anomal detection and um, forecasting and other like things that help us process the data and make the lives of our customers better. So today I'll be talking about designing and building serverless machine learning powered applications with Python. All right, so I'll be dividing my talk into four parts. So part one would be on concepts. Second part would be on design. Third part would be a bit of a deep dive on how to deploy machine learning models. I'll share the variations and techniques there, and especially the details that you have to work with because I'll mention some constraints and challenges that you may experience, and I'll share how we solve that. And then finally, management, how to manage machine learning workflows using different techniques and services and tools. And, and what are the problems that you may encounter in staging our production and how do you solve them? Because we may be able to read a lot of concepts in blog posts, in books, but it's really different when you're trying to serve a lot of customers and then you have production data and you have to handle like migrations or versioning. You have to worry about uh, data migration concerns. You have to worry about data integrity issues. So all of those things, I'm going to help you solve that because it's kind of different when you're trying to lead a team, you're trying to lead a company, you're leading multiple companies, you're trying to correct the way they implement things and how do you enforce processes and how do you audit, how do you manage your entire team and the requirements and how do you transform a culture. So it's a really big topic and I'll make sure that I focus on one thing at a time and there's some synergy between the different parts of this presentation. All right, so let's talk about the concepts. So why are concepts important? So the reason why concepts are important is sometimes when you're trying to create an application Sometimes the first thing that comes into your mind would be what are the tools that I'm going to use to build that application. The problem there is that when you try to use tools and you just try to read the blog posts, you try to read their materials and documentation, the challenge there is when you're trying to host something into production and you encounter problems, it's going to be hard for you to solve the problem because you do not understand the concepts and the underlying details that, um, that, that is abstracted by the tools that you're using. So sometimes the tools that you're using abstract a lot of concepts and you just tend to focus on the integration. When you're wor working on the integration aspects of your application, it just works. So it either works or it doesn't. But let's say that there's a data integrity issue and you're not familiar about the concepts like idempotency keys, having the existence of idempotency keys, why it's important, concepts like linearizability, even the cap theorem, eventual consistency, and other such concepts it will be hard for you to manage those hidden requirements along the way. When you're trying to build something, the only thing that you usually learn in Hello World um, tutorials or blog posts would be, how do I code this? How do I make this work? How do I integrate this? But the proper engineering techniques are usually left out because you'll probably encounter that when something's broken already. And the thing that I want you to understand is concepts are super important. And the last thing you want to do is to be debating which tool is better than the other. I want you to be able to maximize the tools by understanding the concepts first. Next, I'll give a quick intro or just a quick description of the machine learning process. Um, so basically, machine learning is everywhere right now. Um, let's say that I want to identify if the image that I inputted is a cat or a dog. Or maybe I want to predict the future, or maybe I want to um, classify something as A or B, or being able to just detect anomalies. Everywhere in the world right now, instead of us trying to manually do things, we can do a lot of automated stuff using machine learning algorithms. And there are so many algorithms out there 
so much work done by a lot of data scientists and researchers that we tend to sometimes confuse uh, which is the cooler algorithm. So before we start talking about the processes and the steps right here, I want us to ask ourselves, what's the most important thing in machine learning or in data science in general? For me, so it's just an opinion, but I think you'll probably encounter this way of thinking in the future, especially when you go deep dive and trying to work with the team, trying to serve the customer's requirement. For me, the most important thing in machine learning is listening to the customers and also listening to the needs of the business. So being able to go one step back first and being able to understand what's really important, it's about listening to the needs of the customers. You may have the coolest algorithm out there. You may have the most cutting edge algorithm that's super optimal, can work in any kind of context or situation. But if it doesn't fit the needs of the customers, then you will have a tough time trying to um, go forward or move, move forward. I want us to start with um, understanding the needs of the customers because all these other steps would depend on that. All right. So once you understand the needs of the customers and the needs of the business, it's time you go dealing with all of these requirements and steps like data collection, data preparation and cleaning, visualization and analysis to help you check the relationships of the things inside your data. And then you have feature engineering, model training, and parameter tuning model evaluation and model deployment. So the usual things that are usually forgotten when you're learning uh, model evaluation and deployment. So the thing that we need to think about here is what are the different ways to evaluate your model? Because you may be able to follow all the steps, but how can you say that your model is ready for production use and when can you say the mo a model is better than its previous version or a different variation or a different alternative? And then finally, for model deployment, it doesn't mean that you have a model is that it's going to work right away in production because there are so many steps and these steps are so, um, may, may use different tools and services and you may need the infrastructure to get this working, especially when you're dealing with your data sets. You may, you may have some requirements that require you to perform something in a specific amount of time, or you may need um, a large um, sample of data to perform a set, set of steps. So for model deployment, for example, what you usually forgotten here would be the difficulty on how to productionalize your model. So let's say I have a model that allows me to classify if the image is a dog or a cat. If I were to do that locally, that would be easy because either there's a model already for that, you can just follow a tutorial on the internet and have it locally. Once you have to launch that into production, you may encounter a lot of problems because one, there may be constraints like it should be able to respond within one second or less. You may also have budget constraints, which is harder. You will have to manage a team where you're not supposed to touch any of the code base because you're supposed there to manage them. And you have to be able to debug where it's wrong and you need to have a process that in case you need to update your model or you need to update the API, then you have to have a strategy for it. So this is really complicated in the sense that you have to convert the complicated first into something that's complex so that you'll be able to solve the problems one at a time. So like in Python, um, I think complex is better than complicated because at least there you're able to identify the different parts. And the goal is for you to transfer the complex into something that's simpler to assess and process so that you can proceed with what you're trying to achieve. Do not forget your goal. Your goal is to make the customers happy. Your goal is not to show the world that you're the best data engineer and machine learning engineer out there. Your goal is to make your company happy and your customers happy because if you're focused too much on your algorithm, then you're probably be too biased in trying to provide a different alternative which may, be, which may have better metrics or, different, or a different solution expected by your customer. All right, so this is are just icons from AWS. There are other alter, alter, alternatives from other platforms. So feel free to replace them based on your own use case and need and context. So let's say that your company is already using GCP or Azure, 
then just replace them with their, with their counterparts. So for serverless computing, the thing that you have to think about is what, what is it trying to achieve? What's different with the serverless way of thinking than the previous way of doing things? So five to 10 years ago, what we've been doing, or at least from what I've experienced, is I am used to building my own web server. I'm, I'm used to building my own systems, launching EC2 instances or computers, and then configuring them to perform auto-scaling for me. At that time, it was super cool because it was that time where we didn't, you, got, you just pay for what you use, but the, the thing there is you, you still have to configure how to auto-scale your systems. But you save a lot of money because instead of you having a really large instance or a large computer, you can replace it with much smaller ones and then you configure your auto-scaling policies so that it will scale based on your need. The, the serverless movement took one step further. What it allowed you to do is that it makes you focus less on the operational side of things and it made you focus more on your goal, which, which is the business logic. And what you just need to remember, if this is the first time you're going to encounter these icons, is that there are probably hundreds of icons out there that one year or two years from now, you're going to deal with a different set of icons or a different set of services. These services are just building blocks. And let's say you have a Um, sources of like logic and then here you have your own way to secure your data or secure the access rights um, for your architecture so a lot of things have already been encountered by a lot of companies why would you be thinking that this is the first time that your problem is going to be solved so I want you guys to divide your problem into two parts the first part is thinking of the things that's also available are usually done by other companies. So let's say that there are hundreds of companies out there. What's the common thing that's being done by all of those companies? They did operational things like hosting your web server. Probably they had issues dealing with the versioning of their infrastructure. Um, probably they needed some way to secure their data or secure their infrastructure. And the, th the next thing you have to do is instead of reinventing the wheel or building your own thing, Think about the pros and cons on building your own thing and using a managed service. I'm not trying to market the services out there. You can replace them with all your um, services. Let's say this platform has this kind of service. There's probably a counterpart out there that you can replace a certain logo or service there with this counterpart. So if you, if you have some sort of context where the team is already using this platform, then just replace it with your own set of things and you just have to worry about the building blocks. And when you have to scale, the advantage there is you just scale that certain part. So let's say that I have these five fingers. If you're dealing with a monolith, the challenge with these five fingers is if I need to scale this one, I will have to scale the entire thing. So I, let's say I need to scale this part five times. I will have five hands. So even if the other four fingers do not need to be scaled or multiplied, I, I multiplied that cost by five also. But if I need to scale something like this, which is distributed in nature, I just need five of this. So one, two, three, four, five. And then I have this four. At least it scales properly. And I do not have to worry about the cost and the management of, of, of all of those additional resources because it just scales along with your need. And the advantage of that is it allows you to mimic your production environments easily because before the problem is how do I make sure that the production environments are stable? Sometimes, so in the past, when the pricing structure or the way you use or you, the way you price or compute for the cost of your environments is, the way to optimize it is by having a staging or local environment that's kind of different from your production environment. It's similar because you are worried that your EC2 instance or your computer is running 24 seven. 
and you pay for something which may not be used. But when you have a serverless architecture and you're using, let's say, AWS Lambda, which is being, which, which the cost is, I think, um, something per second, if nobody's using your system, especially in your staging environment, at least you're paying for almost nothing. And your production environment, which is almost exactly the same as with your staging environment, and a lot of customers are using that, that's the time when your environment needs to be needs to cost more because it's being used more. So you pay for what you use, and you don't have to worry about scaling and um, stability because at the start, when you have to use these tools, even your local and staging environments behave almost the same as with your production environment. And that's what makes production environments more predictable and stable because it shifts the planning part to the left meaning that you have to plan for failure so nothing fails. Design. So, so we're now in part two, and the goal here is for me to teach you the different ways to architect machine learning-powered applications. So in the previous um, part, I just shared some concepts because you'll need those concepts in the three other parts. All right. So, so if you look at the slide, so help me read it. So when all you have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. If you are a data scientist, or if you are an architect, the last thing you want to do is to have the bias towards certain tools. Sometimes you have the tendency to read something online because it was marketed well. And because it was marketed well, you wanted to put it into your resume. That's a no-no. Because if you want to be a professional that doesn't have that bias, you need to be aware that there are different solutions out there. And when you're choosing a solution, the solution needs to be appropriate to what you're trying to solve. You may be trying to over-engineer something because you thought that that's the cool thing right now when the previous solutions work. So always think about the solutions for the past 10 to 20 years and why they have been working because the world always wants a new solution. When in fact, the previous solutions work well. So when all you have is hammer, everything becomes a nail. But if you have other tools to help you, like different algorithms, different services, a different way of thinking, it allows you to make the more, most optimal solution during the planning phase without you trying to lean towards certain solutions, especially if it doesn't really fit the context well. So your algorithms, if you're a data scientist, if you're, an, if you're, you're a data scientist and you have an algorithm, Try to be familiar with other algorithms or variations of the algorithm. Try to look for other research papers. Try to look for managed services already using that algorithm. Because if that algorithm is already available and you're trying to be biased on the solution that you use, let's say I, I spent 50 hours on my, my own custom model, the challenge there is I may have the bias to use that model even if there's a better one out there. Your goal is not to be too locked into what you have. It's about providing the customer with the best experience and best results. And if you don't have the data for certain algorithms to work, then have a different strategy for it. All right, so let's have our first like simple architecture, especially when you're dealing with machine learning powered applications. Yeah, so take some pictures. <laughs> All right, so. If this is the first time you've encountered the services, just think of the services as building blocks. So all you have to worry about would be uh, the API gateway, what, what is it doing, what it's supposed to do. It's basically just an endpoint for your server. The Lambda is your building block where you don't have to worry about how it's running. It's, ju it's just there to have your Python scripts or functions to connect, let's say, Amazon Recognition and Amazon S3. <laughs> So you can just replace recognition with an alternative, especially if you're do using a different platform. But if I had the requirement where I am supposed to, to detect inside images, the first thing I have to think about is what are the requirements. So the requirement is I have a budget, I have a time constraint, and I want to detect images in, uh, I, I want to detect text inside an image and identify the coordinates. So instead of me trying to build my own model, my goal is to use an existing service which does the same thing for me, especially if it's not part of the customer requirement to build your own model. 
So instead of me trying to be the subject mat matter expert for this, I can spend four hours to eight hours of my time because that service is already available. And I have more time to focus on security. I have more time to focus on the logic, the special cases, the other requirements that the customers may have because I have a tight budget. This is the pragmatic way of solving things because instead of you trying to solve things on your own, there may be an available architecture or an available service to help you start with. Time is always a factor. And never forget about better time management because this is going to be the way your company will defeat other startups. If your company has a competitor and that competitor is another startup with the same idea, what's going to be the factor? Is it the perfect, the, per, the, the perfectness or the completion of your algorithm? No. It's which company is going to launch first and which company is able to test the ideas first so that there's feedback from the market and you're able to tune your model, you're able to improve your system, you're able to optimize the performance, you're able to have data which you can feed into that machine learning process again. Next, so this is a very similar architecture. And in, in this example, my goal is to do language translation. So language translation is not an easy job. So I'm using a service here called Amazon Translate, where the input is a string, and the output is a string also, but in a different language. Trying to create a system on your own with this one, of course, we're going to explain how we'll do it in case you want to customize and use custom models in the future. But I'm just starting off with a very simple example so that you can get the mindset. So in this example, the goal is for us to convert the English what to Japanese nani. And I'm going to just replace that last part, Amazon Translate. And earlier, it was Amazon Recognition. So as you can see, the architecture diagram looks very similar. I just replaced the service with a different one. And the advantage of the system is if I needed to worry about the scaling part of my web server, I do not need to worry about it. Because API Gateway in AWS Lambda is already serverless and scalable in nature. Meaning, if you look at this diagram, when you implement it, it just looks like this. And then if you have 1,000 users running it at the same time, if the limits are properly configured, then you won't have to worry about scaling. Okay, so and the monitoring part is already configured and integrated with CloudWatch logs, the, the logging system or service of AWS, and you don't have to worry about that. Because if you have to worry about the logging component of your distributed architecture, managing it on your own would take a lot of time. All right, so this is the other way to do it. This is a second way to do it. And basically, we're going to introduce SageMaker. And if there are other alternatives and other um, platforms, feel free to use that. But in this case, given that the process is very, very similar as with other needs of other companies, if you look at the set of steps here, you have data collection, data preparation and cleaning, visualization, feature engineering. A lot of these things, especially when you're dealing with um, pro with production data and production processes. The challenge sometimes here is that, let's say this part is using a different tech stack, this part is using a different tech stack. So there's a chance that these things are, are far away from each other. And what this service is trying to do is it tries to automate a lot of those parts. And instead of you trying to worry about trying to productionalize your own environment, I would be able to do that in a single line of code using that service. So there are other options out there, but what I'm telling you is that we want everyone to be focusing on having the best model uh, scores and being able to deploy it so that a consumer can just consume an API and get predictions or be able to classify one from the other. So in this example, we use scikit-learn and SageMaker and through the use of containers, I would be able to perform a lot of the steps and if I have if I had a code, something like this, which I simplified version, which I run locally. So this is a simple example. I would easily be able to convert something like this into something that's coded in SageMaker in a similar fashion. The inputs and the outputs are very similar, but the difference here is how do I host this entire thing into a web server? It's hard to find resources online. And sometimes those res resources lack certain things similar to the concepts I shared earlier, like 
idempotence, knowing of, dealing with concurrency, dealing with scaling, how do you auto-scale the web server. All of the references online, um, they're, uh, they're correct, but you have to look for the right references and you need to iterate and experiment before you get the working solution. So for this case, let's say that I get to evaluate the results, I get to have the model, I get to serialize it and store it somewhere. With SageMaker or an alternative, what you can do is you can just have one line of code because once you have this model with a single line of code that has the model as the parameter, it will automatically create a web endpoint for you. So the hours of work that you're supposed to have when deploying that system, it may take you two months trying to learn all the nitty gritty details on how to scale that, how do you serve that, how do you even integrate and upload to S3, how do you download from S3, when in this example, it's just one line of code. If you look at the pricing for this one and other alternatives, it, it may cost more because it's a managed service, but you have to compare the amount of time you use that managed service and learn it versus the amount of time you spend paying for your engineers. And also the documentation is already documented. Well, if you have internal engineers, then unless that you're super good with documentation and your processes are really smooth, then you have to worry less about those things because a lot of these things are already automated by a lot of different companies. If you have the skill to customize, then do it. But if not, try to focus on your business objectives because trying to build automation systems is cool, but it doesn't necessarily reflect to the revenue of the company. All right, so let's go to the nitty gritty details of this um, talk. So the so in this example, the goal here is to identify the constraints of AWS, Lambda, and the serverless um, architectures. But these constraints are really good because it allows you to solve certain problems which you will encounter in the future. So one of the limitations of um, Lambda, for example, would be the timeout, the limit, the time, the the memory constraint, the storage, and the file size of the package. Meaning, you can have a super large package in, in Lambda plus Python and expect it to be running. So in this example, our goal is to have, let's say, scikit-learn inside Lambda, you can have TensorFlow inside Lambda, and you can have Facebook Profit inside Lambda. So in, in, in our company, what we do is we use Python and R inside Lambda functions. So we needed that one because we didn't want to pay for the EC2 instances that's running 24-7 when in fact you could just have that Lambda function running let's say 5% of the time for the entire day because that's the only time that the customers are using it. So the goal is to have this ones working properly inside Lambda. It's not an easy problem to solve. So if you get something out of this talk, it's probably how do you do it properly. You will find references online but once you have to link everything you'll have to have a lot of trial and error and get some things from the next parts. The problem is the total Lambda package size is 250 megabytes. One year to two years from now, it may change, but either way, it has a limit. And if you install something like TensorFlow or other libraries, it may exceed 250 megabytes. And the goal is, let's say you have a model in your Lambda function or a model in S3, which is loaded by your Lambda function, you still need to have TensorFlow or other libraries or frameworks inside your Lambda function, and how do you fit it all there? If you were to use your local machine, it's easy to get it to work. But if you have to host it inside Lambda, it's not going to work right away. So the solution is, after you have it, until the total size is 250 megabytes. So this is the trickier one. So this is going to be an iterative set of steps because you, you won't get it the first time around. Because when I tried it, oh, it failed, I have to do it again. So after one to two days of experimentation, I was finally able to get it working because it's not documented anywhere. You have your ideas and you have your goal, but nobody's doing the same thing as with you. But you will see different techniques on how to make Python packages work inside Lambda. You encounter other challenges in other services, but the way how you do it. First, you need to do something which is not optimal. In your local machine, get the script running. And the next step is how do you optimize? And this one is an optimization problem. Being able to get the same results with a different file size is the challenge. So after some experimentation and research, I was able to get it to work in less than 250 megabytes by deleting some of the files inside these directories, 
But of course, I made sure that it's not loading anything from these directories. Because if you deleted the wrong file, then there's going to be an error when you run the Lambda function again. And, there's, and you can also reduce the binary file size using strip. And with, that one, with this one-liners, the challenge there is, how do you make the process easily usable by different members of the team? So let's say that you are the sub sub subject matter expert of your team dealing with machine learning requirements and being able to know TensorFlow in and out, or you're able to use Facebook Profit and you know the constraints there. The challenge there is you may be able to get it working in your machine, but having to ha make it be part of the formal process of the company, that's the more challenging thing to do. Because one person is easy, but when you're dealing with, let's say, 10 people, how do you make that process scalable in, when you're trying to get to launch something into production? And let's say that subject matter expert resigns, then who's going to um, continue that kind of process? So the answer there is we use containers, uh, Docker. So containers. We use container technology in order to automate some of the scripts. It, so containers, so, so we built our own custom container that just automates the one-liner scripts so that instead of us trying to type this in the command line, we just have shortcut scripts inside the container. And let's say you have 10 people, instead of these 10 people trying to look at cheat sheets, they just use a container which performs the job for you. So in addition to the container where a lot of things are already pre-installed, you can have automated scripts created by your subject matter expert so that instead of people trying to worry about 20 lines of scripts, you'll just have to worry about three lines, deploy, optimize, reduce this, remove that, and then you can have a framework which will help your company follow it. And then you reduce the binary file size using strip, delete files until the total size is 250 megabytes, and test and deploy the Lambda function. So what's the advantage of having a reduced Lambda function? In addition to that, it works. It's faster also because it loads less files and you, ha and you have less trash inside your Lambda function. Let's say I installed a library which is not really being used by my Lambda function, then why is it there? The advantage of that is it makes your Lambda function smaller and having an optimal solution um, will help you along the way. Management. So this is the last part. This is part four. And even though these are the solutions that I have mentioned, managing them is the So Lambda Layers is just like a piece of your Lambda function. It may be code, it may be a runtime, it may be a library that's packaged so that in case that you have to reuse that layer in other Lambda functions, you won't have to reinstall it again. Because when you're dealing with this kind of architectures, you will have a lot of Lambda functions. And in our example, we have to manage a lot of Lambda functions. So having automated scripts to help you manage your machine learning workflows and machine learning deployments you need to have automated scripts in order to make this all of these things manageable. So when you have Lambda layers, in other Lambda layers, let's say I have to use my, my R scripts. In Lambda, it's not directly supported. But using R runtime, I am able to run R scripts. So maybe you have Ruby code, or you have Python code, or JavaScript code. Python and JavaScript are supported in Lambda. But if it, does, if it doesn't support that language, you can use a runtime for it. And the advantage there is it allows you to combine different tools and services without you worrying about the way it's all coded. The advantage of using the serverless architectures is you can combine different techniques and frameworks and tools and languages. And you'll be able to manage them well. Because let's say I have an R runtime there, it doesn't really affect my Python um, lambdas. All right, so this one, you can have, uh, let's say, your profit package there, and you can easily have that working um, and reuse that in a different Lambda function, which does a different thing. And this one, you can have a, a set of scripts that automates a lot of work for you, so you can have your libraries packaged as well. And when you're versioning your code, and when you're versioning your models also, you can use this advantage so that if you need to roll back or something, you don't have to rebuild, you have, don't have to do anything. 
you can just make the files available immediately so that you can turn back time in case something fails in production. Now, how do you manage workflows? So given that you're using a lot, a lot of Lambda functions and different services, you have to manage state. Dealing with background workers and background process is a challenge on its own. So in the past, I am used to using Python plus Django plus Celery. I have, I have used Pyramid and Celery, RabbitMQ. And I had to train a lot of the DevOps guys in our team how to manage that. Because it's super powerful, that's correct. But if that person resigns, oh, I have to train this set of individuals again. And I have to make them learn these ones. Because I had a lot of experience in the past using that tool, but I had to make sure I scale myself. Because there are a lot of people using that, and if I just did a restart, I cannot go outside of my meeting and restart it for them. The professionals have to be the one performing the work while we proceed with the planning and the standardization and the, and the business requirements. So here, the advantage of utilizing something available already is it allows you to focus on your own goal and there are a lot of tools out there which help you perform this task. So when you're managing workflow, let's say you have your profit um, library and Pyth inside Python plus Lambda, and this is your Lambda function. Step functions, so this is just a, a representation. This is a, this, the, the actual representation is different. But when you're trying to manage workflows, the first rule is try to use a tool which already exists to help you with that kind of requirement. Okay, so if you're, you have other tools, feel free to do so. The only rule that we have is have one and use one if you can have one. Because if you have two and you're trying to experiment with all of these workflow tools, the problem there is everyone has to learn all of these things. The goal here is the business requirement and not the experimentation of tools. So have one standard if you can, have at most two tools for this type of things in case that you're trying to experiment which one is better. And the advantage of this one is that the logs, especially when dealing with the machine learning model, is all located in this one. So the CloudWatch logs is linked to this one, so you can easily look for the logs there. And the state of the workflow is managed by step functions. So how do you interpret this? So there's just a start, there's the process part there, and then it branches off, let's say there's an if condition there. And it's not a Lambda function managing all of this, it's step functions, the service. And the last slide would be, how do I deploy that workflow system into development, staging, and production in a manageable way? The answer is to use the infrastructure as code concepts so that you can document your infrastructure as code. And in this way, so this is basically just a JSON file. And the step functions basically is easily documentable using CloudFormation. So if you use CloudFormation and step functions, you're able to have a development environment which is not configured manually by hand. If you're trying to experiment, use your hands, like your mouse clicks. But if you want to have something which can easily be released to this ones, you can have, a machine, you can have your machine learning application documented through CloudFormation templates. And what that service is doing, it converts into real infrastructure. So if I need to have a staging and production environment, all I need to do is just have to run that template inside the service two more times with different parameters. And the advantage there is it's super similar to this one. And if I had to experiment a change inside the staging environment, then all I need to do is update the script and roll it out also in production environment. And if it fails, because this is the most important part, Always plan for failure. So you need to have two templates ready. And you have your blue-green. It's not really blue-green. But what you're going to do is your template is going to be executed. And then in case it fails, just roll it back to the previous template. The advantage there is you have the ability to manage versions. And you can document your infrastructure properly. So basically, that's it. Um, so in summary, we discussed the concept, the design, the implementation and how to manage things. And I think at this point, you'll be able to manage your uh, machine learning powered applications well, and you have a better way to decide properly. So thank you again, and hope you learned something from, from my talk.